All right. Awesome. Thanks everyone well, for joining yeah. us. So welcome everybody. Uh, we're gonna get we're gonna be sharing a series of slides with you guys that we're gonna try to highlight. You know, a lot of the um, the pertinent points about why people have problems with overactive bladder and bowel, and also what are some solutions that can be uh, thought of to to help those problems. So we're gonna kind of. Uh, Dr. Frank is going to start uh, with the first part of the presentation, and then I'm going to do the second part, and then we're going to leave a lot of time at the end for, for questions. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. Yep, and then we're going to go through some of this a little quickly just because we want to make sure we have time for you guys to ask and get all your questions answered. But uh, one of the things that we always like for patients to know is that this is something that a lot of people don't really talk about, but it's very common, um, you know, the feeling of your bladder is running your life. Will you ever gain control? You're having to plan your life around, you know, your outings and everything around um, your bladder and, you know, all the things that you might need in case you have an accident. A lot of people don't like to bring this up in the office. And this is actually a topic that Dr. Palmer and I would like for people to bring up because it's something that we can help people with. Um, and we're going to go into a lot of the therapies that can hopefully help you. Um, and it's not something that's um, inevitable. So, you know, I'm sure reading some of the different things that are on the slide, that urinating more than eight times a day, having to go immediately and having no leg time between the urge to go and trying to get to the bathroom, getting up many times in the night where it's getting in the way of your sleep. Um, these are all things that are probably sound familiar for you. Um, but it's your body's way of saying, you know, this is something that's going on, but your life does not have to be like this. Um, and like I said, a little bit at the beginning, you're definitely not alone. And a lot of patients are a little surprised to hear some of these statistics. Um, so bladder control pro problems is very common. One in six U.S. adults will be affected with this. And a lot of women think that it's an elderly women issue. And it's definitely not. It's something that we see across all ages. And I think that's an important thing for people to think. It's not just part of aging. Um, or a normal part of aging. It's something that can happen, you know, regardless if you're in your teens or up into your postmenopausal years. So like I said, the good news is, and one of the reasons I think both of us like to do this is it's one of the few areas of medicine where there's a lot of options and we get to see results and can do a lot to help patients and um, help people feel better and get their life back. Um, and so we'll go a little bit into some of the causes of the bladder and bowel control programs. Um, some of it is, you know, some daily habits, things that you eat and drink, some dietary stuff, um, different things with activities with your life, especially childbirth. That's something that can um, lead to this a lot of the times and then different medications and medical issues that some patients may have. So without getting too much into the weeds with this, um, this is just a little bit of an important slide to remember for when we start talking about the different therapies, um, but generally just how bladder control works. So starting up at the brain here. Um, so you have um, nerves that in your brain that will signal to your bladder when your bladder is full that um, it's time to empty. And when your, your bladder is full and stretched from um, urine being in there, that's when it signals up to the brain to say, I really need to use the restroom. And so in patients who are able to hold their urine, that circuit is able to be in control and they're all in sync. And so in patients where you get a little bit of urine in there, and then you're finding that you're having to run to the bathroom, there's an overactive component to that circuit where um, the signal from the bladder is just overpowering the brain's ability to say, no, we're not in the bathroom. Like I'm not gonna empty my bladder yet. Mm -hmm. Similarly with um, bowel control, it's a very similar kind of thing. Um, and so when you have stool in the rectum and that is stretching that area, that is gonna stimulate that it's full. And it again, sends a signal up to the brain and says, okay, it's time for us to empty. And in patients who are able to control that, the brain is able to say, no, you know, don't empty quite yet. We're not in the place where this is a good idea um, versus in patients, unfortunately, where the brain isn't able to overcome that overwhelming, overactive signal. Um, that's where you lose that control. And so a lot of the therapies you'll see here is trying to restore that balance of that um, brain bowel circuit. So three common 
con bladder control pro problems. And this is an important slide, I think, because a lot of patients will hear from family members and you know friends and stuff that, oh, I have leakage of urine and I did this therapy and it really helped. And so patients will come to us and want that specific therapy. But as we tease it out, we learn that you know they don't have the same type of bladder control problem. And the key thing is, is you know, you have stressed urinary incontinence, urinary retention, overactive bladder. And what patients feel is, you know, you'll feel that leakage of urine, but they're actually caused by three very separate things. And so they're treated fairly differently. And then to complicate it all, um, a lot of patients can have a mix of the three different combinations. So it's important for you to see a physician so we can help tease all that out and figure out what is going to be the best therapy for you so that you can get to the goal that you want and back to your lifestyle. So stress incontinence, this is the kind of incontinence where anytime you laugh or cough or sneeze is when you're going to have a little bit of leakage come out or sometimes a lot of leakage. Um, this is the kind of thing where you know, it keeps you from exercising or being able to run around with your kids or your grandkids. Um, and it's from a lack of support where that valve is that's supposed to be closed off. So that lack of support causes that valve to be leaky and then urine will escape through. So a lot of the support structures are loose and the treatments are gained at bulking that up or um, gaining that support in that area to restore that. Urinary retention, this is a more difficult one and usually a little less common, but still just as bothersome for patients. Um, and this is where you can't tell that your bladder is full. So you don't get that urge. You don't get that need to feel like you have to use to the restroom. Or if you do, you get to the bathroom and you know you're full. You just can't seem to empty. It comes up very slowly. And so what happens is that bladder is always operating at just almost at capacity. And the only way that it can empty is by just this insensible loss. Um, and sometimes you lose a lot of urine. So usually you just lose urine without really any apparent trigger. Um, and a lot of times what patients will have to do with this one is use a catheter to completely empty. And then lastly is the overactive bladder. So I always think of a lot of people have seen this commercial where it's the bladder that's um, holding on to the patient and trying to get her to go all over the place so she can find a bathroom or find, you know, a place to empty her bladder. And she's like, no, I want to go shopping. I want to do this. And the bladder's like, nope, we're going to the bathroom because this is what I want to do. And it's kind of like the bladder is taking over your life and has its own little brain. And so this is the need to go all the time. As soon as you get the urge, you have to get up and like push everyone out of the way to try and make the bathroom. And sometimes you don't make it in time um, or you're having to get up in the middle of the night a lot of times to go. Uh, and this is more of a nerve issue or a muscle issue where this is where that circuit is a little overly sensitive and it's there's some disconnect um, where the bladder is just deciding to leak whenever it wants and not really listening to what the brain is telling it to do. I was just going to say, we can, I can see that people are raising their hand or putting in questions and that's a really good thing to do. And we, we want to get to all your questions. And I think what we're going to do is save them for the end. Um, so if you have a a specific question about a specific slide or topic, maybe just jot yourself a little note or just kind of remember so we can go back to that particular piece um, at the end. Next slide. Yep, next slide. Thanks. Um, and lastly, and one reason we like to talk about this is because some of the treatment options actually can also help with fecal incontinence and they do tend to go hand in hand a little bit um, because it's similar nervous systems that's feeding to the same areas. Um, and so fecal incontinence, you don't necessarily even need to be losing stool um, for it to be fecal incontinence. It could similarly be you get a fecal urge to go and you have to get up and run to the bathroom. Otherwise, you might have an unwanted accident. Um, so the urge incontinence is the in inability to resist the urge to go where you just have to run there. And some patients will also lose a little bit of stool, you know, every time that they go. Um, and so this is another thing where we have some treatments that can help you out. All right. Dr. Palmer. Thank you, Dr. Frank. And so I'm going to jump in a little bit more now about kind of the ways that we can think about treating incontinence. And we're going to talk through a few different ideas, um, kind of some conservative and more advanced therapies as we go. 
So a lot of people, uh, I think, probably don't realize that some of the things that they're doing in their daily life um, can make a big impact on how their bladder responds to them and, and how their bladder can rule their life. And, and there, there can be some simple uh, things that can be done to really help that. Um, some of the, some of the things, you know, like related to diet, um, you know, liquid intake, um, you know, a lot of people have hypersensitivities and inflammatory triggers with some of the things that they eat or drink that can make their bladder more overactive and exploring those things can help. Um, a lot of people don't think about what they're, the volume that they're drinking, you know, late into the evening. A lot of people are very sensitive to caffeine or alcohol or other irritants of the bladder that can make uh, their bladder hyperactivity more prominent. Um, and so, you know, we think about some of those things in conjunction with other more advanced therapies to, to really round out uh, kind of a, a, a best way to get your bladder feeling feeling well. Um, there's there's a lot of things that can be accomplished with uh, pelvic floor physical therapy and bladder and bowel retraining, um, also sometimes called biofeedback. And you know we that's something that both Dr. Frank and I really emphasize in a lot of aspects of overactive bladder um, and and stress incontinence as well. But essentially, you know, it's a it's, it's just taking a good look at the pelvic floor and how the muscles uh, and the nerves of the pelvic floor can be um, kind of tuned up in a sense. Sometimes it's, it's high pelvic tone or sometimes there's, there's really low uh, muscle control or the, some people think that they have been told just do Kegels, you know, but they don't really know what that means to be able to properly apply the right squeeze pressure to get a, a desired result. And so Sometimes we'll, um, as a part of the kind of the journey of exploring, helping your, your bladder, we'll, we'll refer you to a pelvic floor physical therapist where they're advanced, specially trained to, to do those types of things and help you through those things. Um, a lot of people have probably seen ads and heard, heard you know, thoughts about oral medications for the bladder. Um, oral medications for the bladder are oftentimes uh, a first line therapy and they can control symptoms. Um, they, they do work sometimes, but I think that the, the bottom line is that, you know, they don't always work. And a lot of times people find a frustration point um, related to side effects related to the overactive bladder medications. Um, sometimes it's cost related, or sometimes it can have other side effects like increasing your blood pressure. Um, but commonly people that have tried these medications uh, report things like dry mouth, blurry vision, and constipation, uh, particularly because the bladder, you know, is kind of a, it's a, it's a smooth muscle organ. And, and when you take a, a medication to kind of help calm that down, it's going to affect other, other things in your body that are also subject to that same type of muscle control. And that can lead to these types of side effects. So a lot of people don't think about the why of it, but I think it's helpful to understand that. Um, and so, you know, 20% of overactive bladder patients um, say they're extremely satisfied with their current treatment, uh, whereas 82% um, of overactive bladder patients are non-adherent to the medications at 12 months. This is just kind of across the board. So that tells you that, you know, there's kind of this high attrition rate of people taking medications, um, not liking the experience that they had on them, either they didn't work well enough or they gave them side effects. And they kind of, um, they just kind of say, well, that didn't work. And so they kind of fall off the map and they don't follow up. So I think, I think one of the things that we, Dr. Frank and I both really like to emphasize is that, you know, this is kind of, this is definitely not a one size fits all kind of program. And we have to kind of work with patients and, and we, we both, um, supply patients with, with kind of a, a bladder health pathway. It's, it's a little document that we kind of work through and we talk about, this is where you're at. This is what you've tried. This could be the next possible step. Let's see each other again in about a month or two months or whatever to kind of readdress where you're at. And that, that type of thing is really important to achieving an optimal result for, for you rather than, than just becoming frustrated by one treatment modality and kind of saying it's not for me and moving on. So we're going to get into a little bit more of some advanced therapies. Um, we talked about meds. You know, there's a lot of things to talk about around meds. And, and you know, there's certainly plenty of room to discuss those things at a, you know, in an office visit. Uh, I know a number of people in the 
in the poll at the beginning indicated that they've that they tried meds or uh, that they tried multiple meds. So certainly something to continue to work through. And as we as we kind of work down that line of um, kind of that bladder care pathway, we start to kind of encounter some other advanced therapies that a lot of people do end up going to because frankly, they work better and they and they have a more long lasting effect. Um, so some of those things related to the bladder control are that we're going to talk about are uh, the Medtronic interstim systems, the Medtronic neuro system, and then injected medications like bladder Botox. Um, and then similarly for the bowel control, um, talking about surgical options versus interstim, which is also, uh, you know, to be clear, it's kind of like people think a lot about the bladder and this kind of thing, because that's, it's probably the more pressing uh, concern uh, for a lot of people. However, this particular um, talk is really trying to target bowel, bowel issues as well, uh, because there's some excellent benefit towards a lot of those bowel control symptoms with as we're going to continue to talk about here. So Botox medication, this is something that both Dr. Frank and I do as well occasionally. Um, it's, a, it's an office-based procedure. It involves um, placing a scope in the bladder and placing a, a small needle to inject uh, small areas of Botox uh, into the bladder. So there's, there's Botox is a, is a compound that's a medical compound that most people think of for reducing wrinkles in your face. However, there's uh, lots of different applications for Botox in the body. And so I think we wanna uh, understand that the way that it can work in the bladder by injecting the bladder muscle is that it, it just sort of makes the bladder less hyperspastic. Uh, it can be comparable to oral medications in, in several trials that have, been, that have been reported. And it doesn't, it's more of addressing a muscle problem. So when you think about that pathway that Dr. Frank talked about, um, kind of talking about the brain to the bladder response. This isn't really doing any um, change to that brain telling the bladder to go. It's a sort of just kind of making it so the muscle can't can be as contractile and you know can't be as hyperactive and it just reduces that the symptoms by redu by reducing the contractility of the bladder essentially. And so along with that, what you can see at times is that people can develop, um, some retention of urine or the possibility that they may have a higher chance of developing bladder infections. Um, and, and I, I'm a, I'm a believer in Botox. I think that it does really, really help people. I don't have, I don't have a lot of negative things to say about it other than the fact that those things can occur for people. And it's not necessarily the right therapy for a lot of people because a lot of people, again, get frustrated by repetitive follow-up. So that's what I've seen, um, you know, as well, um, you know, the, the intent of Botox is that it does wear off. It wears off for most people in about six to nine months, and, and then your symptoms return. So, you know, when you think about those drawbacks, um, that it's just part of the, you know, the, the discussion that we would have about what therapy is right for you and why. Um, as we move into uh, kind of this, kind of this nerve concept now, okay, another, another way to stimulate the nerves that affect the bladder is what's called the percutaneous tib tibial uh, neuromodulation system. This is, this is a minimally invasive therapy that's done in the office. Uh, a small acupuncture type needle is inserted into uh, a person's tibial nerve. So kind of down by your ankle, uh, by the inside kind of bump bone of your ankle. And it is essentially stimulating a, a nerve tract that kind of goes up to that bladder bowel, uh, you know, kind of distribution. Okay. So it, what the, what you do with this therapy is that you come into the office for 30 minute sessions for 12 weeks. And during, during that time, uh, you're, you're just kind of sitting in an exam room, you're having this therapy done and you know, that the concept of how it's going to affect your bladder is accomplished over a series of sessions like this compared to the next thing that we're going to talk about, which, which I'll show you. So, um, and then followed by monthly maintenance sessions for potential long-term relief. I would say that people that don't have a desire for any kind of an implantable device for whatever reason, it, um, it, this could be a good option for them. It is quite a bit more onerous on your time. Um, and generally, um, in my experience, it's less effective than the implanted devices for the bladder control. 
Uh, but it is a safe, effective, and minimally invasive therapy that just requires a 30-minute office visit and uh, with some initial upfront several sessions, 12, and then some ongoing maintenance. All right, so now we're going to talk about sacral neuromodulation through the Medtronic interstim systems. So this concept is, it, it's, I describe it to people in different ways, but essentially it's gentle nerve stimulation that corrects the communication pathway, that dysfunctional pathway where your brain is telling your bladder and your bowel to contract when it's supposed to be able to hold. And it sort of um, disrupts that signal. So it, it just creates a little bit of a distraction for that nerve signal so that the that when the brain is telling the bladder to empty, it, it overrides that signal and essentially creates the effect of allowing you to have more control over your bladder and your bowels. It's statistically proven to have more efficacy than medication. And what we typically do with this um, is we do sort of a cadence of Visit. So the first visit is a test procedure. It's a simple procedure that's done without any anesthesia. It's done in the office with an injection of lidocaine and placement of a small wire into the nerve space. Um, it usually takes about 15 to 20 minutes to place this. And there's a little external battery that kind of clips onto your pants for, you know, it, the intent is about a week trial. Most people don't last that long because the wires can move a little bit during the trial. So usually it's it's about a two to three day trial where you're going to get the same therapy that you would get from a long-term uh, implanted device, but it's just kind of, it's basically a way to test to see if this therapy is right for you. And at that point of, you know, that test will, will, you'll be in communication with, you know, with Medtronic, you'll have, um, you know, a log that you'll keep about your symptoms. And we'll kind of then meet, you'll meet with Dr. Frank or I uh, after a few days to kind of go over that information and kind of make that decision. Yeah, this really worked for me and I want to move on to that implanted device. Um, so I think we're going to get into a little bit more of the specifics. Oh, yeah, about that. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, there's a couple different options for the implanted device that we'll talk about. There's a recharge free option. Um, and a rechargeable option. And so, you know, what I, what I've really, I've been doing this type of therapy for a long time since pretty much since I was with Oakdale for about 10 years, I think maybe about eight years or so I've been doing these types of procedures, but just within the last, um, you know, let's say year or two, we've, the battery technology has advanced significantly. So whereas the devices, the, the batteries that we were replacing in it originally were lasting about three to five years, depending on the power that you had to have it on for the effect, uh, they're now lasting 10 plus years, 10 to 12 to 15 years sometimes uh, with a, with a non-rechargeable battery. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the way that you control it has advanced and uh, the way that it interface, it can be controlled remotely has advanced. And there's a lot of advantages now that we didn't have earlier on when we were first implanting these. So this type of therapy has had over 375,000 worldwide patients. We talked about the simple tests that we would do in the office. Um, you know, we talked about a small battery and a wire, everything that, that we put in is, um, okay. So this is, this is talking about the trial. Sorry. All right. So this is talking about the trial and, you know, recording daily symptoms. And, you know, then I talked about talking with your doctor about the bet about if this is the right, you know, result for you. So as we, then as we move into the concept of the implant, it's done um, usually in a surgery center, or it could be in the hospital, but it's done under um, a, a sedation type procedure. So you are asleep for the procedure, but you're not um, under full anesthesia. Uh, it's done with x-ray guidance placement. So we make sure we get it in exactly the right place as we as we put that wire and that battery in. And then everything um, is internal. So there's nothing external. What The way you control it is with a small remote uh, that, uh, you know, basically is a, is a digital re remote controller. Uh, it's, based, it's based off a Samsung type phone operating device. And it um, allows you to sort of turn off, on, up, and down, and change the program 
and the, the stimulation level that you're getting from this therapy to find the optimal uh, therapeutic regimen for you. And there's, there's a lot of things we can talk about around that. Um, and, you know, we would spend time on that uh, as we needed to, but that's kind of the general concept. Another really important thing that people ask about related to this is MRIs. So if I've got, you know, some metal, like a battery in me, um, can I have an MRI if I had to? And typically prior to the new technology, the answer was no for lower body MRI. However, uh, the, the technology has advanced, the batteries and the leads have advanced. And so we now are able to, if a patient needs an MRI and they have an implanted device, it can easily be put into MRI mode and it can be, that that is not a consideration that we have to worry about any longer. So all that to say, is this therapy right for you? You know, we, um, we think about this for patients that have significant symptoms, symptoms that are resistant to, to more conservative therapies like lifestyle changes and oral medications. Many people have tried overactive bladder medications and physical therapy, and I've done Kegels and all those things. Um, but ultimately, many people still feel frustrated with their bladder symptoms and their bowel symptoms. And, you know, if you know, if you're ready to say that's me and I have, you know, experienced that, then, you know, then you, then you should consider the, that these therapies may be right for you. So 84% satisfaction amongst those who use it for bladder control, uh, three times greater improvements in quality of life compared to medications and 89% of people using the Medtronic bowel control therapy experience long-term success. So that's the end of our slides. And I know we got through that fairly quickly, um, but I, I think that that's where we wanted to kind of at this point now take questions. So go ahead and um, Jess, do you wanna moderate that? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so thank you, Dr. Palmer and Dr. Frank. Um, the first question that we had, I have read that using a vibrator helps to strength, strengthen the pelvic muscles. I think it's just more of a comment. I don't know if it's really a question sure. or I don't know if you want to address that. Do you want to address it or do you want me to? Yeah, I, I have heard that actually in the past. Um, I think it's it's kind of a similar idea to stimulating and um, being able to help guide your Kegel exercises. Um, so I think if that's something that's been you want to try and could be helpful, I think um, it's worth trying. I think in the same light of trying to do Kegel exercises, I think what we find a lot of times is it'll help for a little bit. And then eventually a lot of times symptoms will progress, but it's a nice, uh, less invasive option to try that you can do at home. Yeah. I don't know if you have anything to add. Well, I, I think about there's, there's a lot of devices that you can, that you can find online for, you know, for helping your bladder have more control. And, and I think those things are good ways to augment other therapies. Um, I think it's it's a tool that people can use for home use. Probably a little bit of a difficult time, like having sustained progress with something like that, but it can help. And then, um, so someone says both their chiropractor and gynecologist have encouraged them to drink half their body weight in ounces. How can a woman drink that much and still hold their urine? Well, I think that, you know, there's, as we kind of think back to that, the where and, and the when of what you're drinking, it does impact your bladder. So water's great. You should definitely drink a lot of water. It's very healthy for you, but you have to realize the, um, the effect that it's going to have on your bladder, you know? And so, you know, ultimately ther therapy is designed around helping your bladder we want to get you to a place where you can drink as much water as you need to drink and that's healthy for you and still feel like you have control over that. But you just, you just have to think, you know, have to consider that when it comes to the where and the when and the how much, um, you know, related to intake in general. So one thing I usually like to guide, you know, a lot of people will say you're supposed to do eight, eight ounce glasses of water a day. And I actually completely disagree with that. I feel like most people, not every single person is the same. Some people who are more active are going to need more than eight ounce glasses, eight, eight ounce glasses a day. And 
people are a little bit more sedentary or, or have lower metabolisms or not, maybe won't need that much. So it sounds weird, but I usually tell patients to look at the color of their urine. Um, if you're drinking water and it, you, when you use the restroom, it's completely clear, then you probably can back off because that's actually a little too much water and you're just feeding your urine problem. Versus if it's a dark gold and yellow color, you could probably drink a little bit more water. You're aiming for like a lighter yellow. That's usually what I always say to kind of guide what's a good amount. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right. So this one's related to medication. It says medication is working for me, but the cost is really high. What can I do next? Uh, that's a common reason why some patients were, if it's working really well, which is good because it means a lot of these therapies would also probably work for you. It means you have a kind of mm -hmm. uh, incontinence that would benefit from, you know, the sacral neuromodulation or one of these, you know, higher level, but more minimally invasive surgeries um, or procedures. And a lot of patients' cost is a completely valid reason to want to move on to that. There might be a higher cost up front, but since there's things that you don't have to maintain quite as much in the long run, it ends up being a little bit more cost effective. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people think about like insurance companies, will they pay for it and stuff like that? And, you know, essentially be, not being able to um, remain on the therapy that you're on because of cost is, is really a, a reason why you need to consider moving on to a more advanced therapy. And so that's that's a, a, a verifiable reason that we can talk about with your insurance company and list in the notes to make, you know, to make a case for you to be able to receive a higher level of therapy. So, you know, it's it, it's it's a aside from side effects, it's the most valid reason why people don't adhere to therapy. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. There were some treatment or there were some uh, questions asking how many of these treatments are covered by insurance, but you kind of touched on that, Dr. Palmer and Dr. Frank. I don't know if you want to say anything else regarding the insurance coverage. No, I agree with that. I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I would say it's pretty widely and broadly covered. I mean, mm -hmm. generally speaking, we don't have a lot of trouble with um, these types of therapies being covered for the right reasons for patients. So yeah. it's, it's why it's important to meet with, with your doctor and, talk it through and build, build sort of the scenario that, that is your scenario. And so we'll, we'll be asking a lot of detailed questions and putting in detailed notes about your symptoms and what you've tried in the past, what's worked and what's not in order to say, yeah, boy, it really makes sense for you to try this next therapy, you know? And so, and then insurance says, yeah, they talked about all the right things. They've tried the things that they, you know, they should have tried in a first line conservative therapy and it didn't work for them. So, you know, that's basically how it works. So we'll, we'll help you with that. Yep. Perfect. Um, someone's asking, how long does it take for me to see results with Botox? I had it done, but I continue to leak. Usually you'll see, I mean, you'll start to see some results fairly quickly. I, I find most patients, their peak effect usually is around one to two weeks, definitely by two weeks, you should be seeing what you're going to get. That's what I find. Um, yeah. If it's, if it's not working within a, a couple of months, you know, or a month, let's say it's probably, probably not going to work for you. Mm -hmm. um, so not sure why, you know, specifically in, in this person's case, it didn't, but that would be something to, that we would help you sort out. And it kind of goes along with that whole, not one therapy fits everybody. And another good reason why it's a great idea to come in and chat with us. We will ask you more questions than you ever thought we could ask you about the bladder and your urinary symptoms, but it's just trying to figure out the best thing for you. Yeah. And one of the other things that I, that just came to mind too, that we didn't really touch on in the slides is there's different, um, you know, it's important to sometimes when people go to their doctor, like maybe their primary care doctor, or, um, you know, they, they just get kind of advice, like you should try this med, but I think it's important to work up the, the bladder situation really well. And so in order to achieve the best therapy, we need to understand the most that we can about your bladder. And so sometimes we'll recommend a, a testing uh, regimen called urodynamics, which is kind of a, an office-based procedure that helps us to uh, sort of do like kind of a bladder challenge test where we'll put some fluid in your bladder. We'll check um, the capacity of the bladder and how, how much uh, muscular urgency response that your bladder has and, and how the ability of your urethra to hold urine. And all these sort of things helps kind of continue to build a story for what type of incontinence you might have. And then in turn, what type of therapy will work for you. So, you know, in order to be able to get the best result, you have to be able to see a, you know, a specialist that 
is going to work it up in the right way for you and not kind of maybe just throw a med at it. And then if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yep. You know? Someone's asking, can I cut down on catheters if I get this therapy? And I'm assuming they're talking about sacral neuromodulation. And I guess the, the catheters, is that in the sense of retention of urine and not being able to empty the bladder? They didn't mention, so I don't know. Not, yeah, I don't know. If it is, then yes, then I mean, it has been shown to be able to help with that just because again, it's helping to regulate some of that nerve pathway to the bladder. Um, assuming that's the reason for why catheterization is happening. Um, yeah, and there's different reasons for that, but we would have to kind of dig into that a little bit as yeah. to why you know you would require catheter use. Yeah, great. So follow up and make an appointment with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone says, I have the stimulator for bladder control, but I now have bowel problems. Can it be used for this? And I think you guys mentioned it can. So I just don't, what's the best thing for them to do? Follow up with you all? Yep. And I know that seems to be the answer for everything, but um, <laughs> a lot of the reasons is because it, it is a fairly complicated thing where it's very intermixed with a lot of other issues going on with the pelvic floor. Um, and so it's really helpful for us to get a detailed history and figure out your story and, you know, the best thing that'll work for you. Um, but traditionally, yes, the sacral neuromodulation will definitely help with both bowel and bladder issues. Yeah. And I think what, what people also don't always think about is that we really try to encourage patients to have, when they get a, an implanted device like InterStim, to have a regular follow-up um, routine, like yearly is, is ideal, I think, because we like to be able to, uh, you know, check the, the battery life, check the signal that your, that your controller is, is giving to the battery, um, make some adjustments potentially. And, you know, one of the nice things about InterStim is that can, it, it can actually be adjusted remotely. Um, which is a, a really cool feature. And so, you know, basically if, if you have something like InterStim, you have to know that it, sometimes it can require a little bit of tweaking to get it right. And you can actually change the, the lead that it's stimulating. There's, there's several different little points on the, on the wire that are inserted into that sacral space. And you can, you can sort of gain a little bit of a different effect to the nerve by changing that stim a little bit. And so that's, those are some of the things that we want to work with you on and follow up on to get the best result. Um, so back to medications, it says you talked about some of the medications having side effects. Are they permanent? None that I can think of that are permanent. I don't think so. Yeah. No, that, you know, the, these are basically, um, like I was talking about that whole smooth muscle response thing, it's kind of once once your body kind of clears it from your system, it'll it'll return it'll return to normal. Someone says I have one kidney. Would this be something that could be done? Yep. Yeah. No. No reason to not do advanced therapies for for one kidney. Definitely not. And then if you have a frequent urge to go along with a feeling like you need to continue to go once completed, similar to UTI symptoms. Would these treatments help that also? Uh, so that, you know, the, I think the answer to that, I'll use Dr. Frank's line. You should come in and talk to us. <laughs> it's true though, because, you know, um, you know, there's different things that can cause that symptom. And so sometimes people have, um, commonly have symptoms of prolapse where the bladder will have dropped a little bit um, and, and you can get retention from not being able to fully and completely empty your bladder due to, due to kind of trapping of urine with prolapse. Um, that's just one thing. And so I think, you know, it, it requires a, a workup and an exam and kind of a conversation to figure that out, but very common hear that from a lot of people. And yes, it's very common that we can help you with that problem as well. And sometimes it means more of a surgical consideration. Sometimes it means Yes, going on with something like InterStim. Someone's asking kind of the difference between InterStim and the neuro system. Like, can you kind of explain the differences? They want to know, like, I think they're planning to get the neuro system and they just want to make sure they're not wasting their time if it's less effective. I find it, I mean, I have a few patients that have done it. It can be effective. Um, I mean, I guess in some ways, it, I have one patient that loves it and she's continued to do it. Um, I think one thing that's nice is it gives you a good little preview of if it's, 
useful and you like it, but you're not quite getting the result you want, it, it leads well into doing the sacral neuromodulation. Um, I think, you know, the big benefit to using it is that it's less invasive. You know, it's an office visit versus going into the operating room. Mm -hmm. um, but I know, yeah, again, it would be another thing where we could definitely tease that out for you and see which therapy is the best for you. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but yeah, I mean, it's, I think it does work and it's good. Th it's a good therapeutic option for some people, but the majority of people find that, you know, it's a little bit too potentially time consuming yep. or a little bit sort of not worth that compared to the benefit they could get from an implanted device. And so mm -hmm. I don't, again, I don't want to talk negatively about it, but I just, just in what, what I've seen in comparison, you know, most people find that they, when they know all the facts about their options, they tend to kind of lean towards something that's going to be more kind of a one-time placement. Um, yeah. and then it's just going to be working for you without having to have repetitive multiple visits. And the reason why it's a little less effective, I think that we're finding is um, the sacral neuromodulation is one where we're actually using imaging to make sure it's a much more precise placement. Um, and so we know it's going exactly where we want it to go. And we're using very specific responses to know that we're getting the response that it's going to do what we want it to do versus the one in the office. There's a little bit of a trial and error and we're going off of, you know, the reaction the patient has. Mm -hmm. um, and for the most part, it's still fairly effective, but yeah, I definitely agree the the one-time placement is a lot better, I think. Yeah. I think we have some questions related to the test. So um, they're asking, does the wire inserted affect intercourse? And then if you have the temporary implant, can you unplug it to exercise and shower, et cetera? So I don't know if you want to kind of go through that test again or talk about that wire being inserted as well. Sure. So the test is really designed just to give us some information for a really brief time. It basically, we want to see if it's going to work for you. Mm -hmm. So I, I usually look at it as the most benefit you're going to get out of it is for about three days, you know? And so during those three days, I encourage it. And basically, you know, again, it's, it's done in the office. You're, you're awake, but we just use local localized, you know, pain control. Uh, most people tolerate it very well. Um, and then once, once we place these little wires, they're kind of taped down on your back and the, and the little clip thing just kind of clips onto your pant line. So really I tell people like, don't really shower. Um, you know, you don't want to get it fully, fully wet. So you can just like wash yourself sponge bathe, but you know, we don't really want to get it submersed or wet, or it is going to move. Like if you exercise, it's probably going to mess up the tape and maybe move the wires. And so, you know, in order for us to get the most information from this test, it's optimal that you try to just leave it quiet, you know, don't mess with it so that we can see if it's going to work for you. It's kind of the, the essential. I mean, you can, there, there are no limitations to what you can do when you have it, we're, but we're really trying to accomplish getting information from it. Mm -hmm. It's not going to harm you if you move around. No. It just might harm no. us figuring out the results of the test. Yeah. Because again, the, you know, these little, these little wires that are placed are, they're, they're just kind of, they don't have any fixed, um, ability for them to stay in position like the, the implant wire does. So the implant wire has a special kind of plastic tined lead on it, where when you place that, that into the spot and you x-ray it and make sure it's in the exact right spot, it doesn't move and it's all internal, it's all implanted. So there's nothing external to bump or shift or anything like that. So that's the difference is this external wire is a a small, tiny little wire that's intended to give us information, but not intended to really stay where, where you put it. Cause you're going to be pulling it out in a few days in the office anyway. So. Someone's asking what are the benefits with an OBGYN physician versus a urologist? And then related to that, someone wanted like they're interested, but they wanted to check in with their primary care doctor first. So I don't know if you kind of wanted to address the different providers. Yeah. And there's some crossover between um, urologists and people who do like gynecologists who do a lot of uro gyne. Um, and so I think both of those are types of physicians who have had specialized training in this type of therapy and, you know, bladder control issues. Um, I would say general gynecologists who haven't focused on this or had specialized training on this are probably not quite as well versed. 
Um, and similarly, most likely not primary care physicians, although you know there are, might be some who are, have take a little bit more interest in it, might know a little bit more, but um, typically you need very specific training in order to be able to get a good assessment and point patients in the right direction and be able to give good therapies. Um, and so I think that would be why, you know, if you're not going to see one of us, I would definitely at least try and see someone who has, who do, does these procedures, is com comfortable with, you know, working up patients and helping them find the right fit for them. And I think I would just add that, you know, from a, a urogynecologic perspective, we, we tend to, you know, urologists are really going to be focused on your bladder. That's kind of their wheelhouse, right, is bladders and kidneys and, you know, urinary collection system, but they don't really tend to think through as much in relation to the relationship to the vagina, the uterus, um, prolapse, you know, and so there's a lot of things that can have overlap. And, you know, my bias, I guess, is that we will generally consider all of those things in regards to your symptoms, rather than just thinking it's only a bladder problem, because it may be more complicated than that. You know, so that's probably the difference. All right. I think this will be the last question. So it says, I don't have bladder issues during the day, only in the morning. I don't empty my bladder all the way. And then less than a minute after using it, I have to use it again. Um, so I guess just what are your thoughts? And they say something about with prolapse, you mentioned you can treat that with mu muscle strengthening. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any other comments to that. <laughs> it's not really a question, but just people are having issues and come in to see you so that you guys can diagnose and figure out what's best next steps. Yeah. I mean, you know, so the, it goes back to the, you know, the idea that there's potentially more than one thing going on and we need to kind of sort that out. Mm -hmm. uh, it does kind of remind me of symptoms that people describe to me a lot where they do have a little bit of a, of an, of a cystocele or an anterior bladder prolapse. And, you know, sometimes that can lead to the, to the retention issue where, you know, you, you kind of trap urine. So you like, you're, you're laying in bed at night and, you know, you're, you're, you're relaxed and your bladder's kind of filling overnight. Right. And it gets pretty full. And then, you know, you get up and go to the toilet and your bladder is full and, and then it, it can't fully empty because it's sort of trapped in that kind of pocket of prolapse. So that's just one reason, but, um, it's a common one. And, and I hear that some people all the time. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, where are you guys located? And do you have a phone number? I think there's one more slide, Dr. Palmer, if you want to share yep, that. We're in. <laughs> I tried clicking. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I not have that up for a long time. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> although it doesn't have the locations, I don't think. Okay, but I think it was on the front. After. So like Plymouth, Blaine, Maple Grove? Yep. Yeah, Plymouth, Plymouth Blaine, Blaine, and Maple Grove. Grove. Okay. Yep. And I think, do you go to Plymouth ever? I don't go to Plymouth anymore, but. Okay, so you're you're in Maple Grove and Blaine, and I I... I'm not a lot in Maple Grove, but I am there occasionally. And I'm every week, I'm for sure in Blaine and Plymouth. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for taking the time to do this. Um, it was very informative and we're super, super grateful for your time. Thank you everyone else for joining us. And please jot down the phone number, the 763-587-7000. If you want to schedule an appointment, um, much of what was discussed tonight was relevant to so many of you. I can tell by the questions. Um, so we want to make sure that you know, each person is unique and it's very beneficial to make an appointment to follow up with your bladder and bowel concerns. Um, so thank you, Dr. Frank and Dr. Palmer. Yep. Thank you everybody Thanks. for coming. Thanks everybody. Good night. All right. Bye everyone.